If you have your Bibles, turn with me if you would this morning to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. For those of y'all who have uh, heard me preach a few times, I, you know that this is my, my favorite way to preach. I like to take a, a passage of, of Scripture in the Old Testament and, and a story that, that, that has happened all those years ago and, and relate it to our lives uh, even, even still today. And, and some people ask me sometimes, I've had people ask me, why do you like, why do you like preaching from the Old Testament so much? And really the only answer that, that I can give is I can say that, that when I'm looking at the Old Testament, you know, when I'm looking at who God is and not who he was, right? And when I read the Old Testament, I'm reading what God says and not what he has said. Because I believe that the God that we read in the book of Genesis is the same God that we read in, in the book of Revelation. And I know that God speaks even through his entire word and, that, and that, that has been given to us. And so as we look this morning in Daniel chapter 4, and if you haven't found that yet, it is in, in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, in the Old Testament there, we're going to answer this question this morning. How far will God go? How far will God go? See, one of the deepest thoughts that you can ever think about God in your life is how far will God go? To what lengths will God go to show his love to you? To what lengths will he do that? And hopefully, uh, by the end of the message this morning, you will agree with me by saying, however far it takes, whatever is necessary, you know, whatever God needs to do, that's what he will do. And I believe he proved that at the cross. I believe that, that he showed us how much he loves us and how far that he would go to prove his love towards us. Now, most of us will have to admit that the first time that God spoke to us, we didn't necessarily respond to the call that he gave us, whether it was for salvation, whether it was a call to ministry, whatever it was that God was speaking to us about, most of us thought we had a better way. Most of us thought we could do it on our own, and most of us uh, maybe have even, you know, uh, just ran from God's call. So what happens you know, when, when, that, when, that, when that takes place, if you're here this morning and you, and you can relate to that, you will know that God turns up the volume a little bit. And if you still don't listen, he'll turn it up a little bit higher. And he will continue to turn up the volume until he has your full and undivided attention. And so, and even for some of us, it took a desperate situation. It may have taken a tragic accident in your life for, for, in order for God to get his message across to you. I mean, some people just, it, they just... They're so hard-headed, it just takes the hard things in life. They have to learn the lesson the hard way. And if you can relate to that, you can relate to the story that we're going to read here in Daniel chapter 4 this morning. You see, we're going to see a king in Nebuchadnezzar this morning who went absolutely crazy. A man that, that God was speaking to and God was trying to reveal himself to King Nebuchadnezzar, and yet he ran from that call until finally God allowed him to go absolutely crazy. Crazy, And even though this is a story and something that takes place over 2,000 years ago, I believe the story and, the, and the, the moral of this story today is relevant even today because I believe the culture has changed, the world has changed, but I believe that in men's hearts and men's mind, even today, they haven't changed a lot. There are still people out there today who believe they can do it without God, that they don't need God, they don't need His salvation, they don't need His grace, that they've got it all together and they don't need God and they're running from the call of God. So the world is filled with men and women who don't need God. They think they don't need him. But, but listen to me this morning. One of the stories, one of the things that we can learn from this story this morning is God knows how to humble the proud. God knows how to humble the proud. And so that's one of the things we're going to be looking at this morning. So just a couple of things real quick to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be looking at here in Daniel chapter 4. Now, Daniel and his Hebrew friends have been taken into captivity. They're living in bondage. In the, in, the, in the land of Babylon. And so far, their, their, their faith has been tested. They, their faith has been, take, has, has been put into the test because uh, they've been forced to assimilate to the Babylon culture. But yet, they're not, but, but they're, their faith has been tested and they've stood by their faith. And on more than one occasion, King Nebuchadnezzar has had to recognize and, and he has had to uh, uh, say that their God is the Most High God. You see, in Daniel chapter 2, we see the story of where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And only Daniel was able to interpret that dream. And we find Nebuchadnezzar there uh, testifying that his God was the most high God. Then in Daniel chapter 3, we see the story that focuses on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they, as they uh, refuse to bow down to this, to this golden image or this image that was made of the king. They refused to bow down to it. And God rescued them from the fire furnace. And again, we find King Nebuchadnezzar revealing and saying that their God is the most high God. Now, Daniel chapter 4, the focus is on King Nebuchadnezzar here this morning. And uh, he's the center of attention. And, other, and unlike any other passage or any other chapter in this book, 
This is written by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. In fact, if you look at the very first few verses and the very last few verses, you'll see that it's written in the first person. He, he is writing this himself, and it's almost like you're reading uh, his diary and account of something that has happened in, it, in his whole life. So the story begins at a time when King Nebuchadnezzar is at the very height of his reign. Everything is going good. He's one of the, he is the greatest king in the world right now. His nation is the most prosperous nation in the world at this time. Everything is just going good. You know, and he's the mightiest man in the world at this time. He is the commander over the greatest army. When he spoke, people listened and people obeyed. And this city of Babylon, what a great city this was in, in, the, in this nation at that time. I mean, it was the, where the hanging gardens were at, which is one of the uh, wonders of the ancient world back in those days. You find that this entire city was surrounded 15 miles of double walls that were something like 27 feet thick and something like 80-something feet tall. And they said they used to race chariots around the top of this wall. So it was just a very well-fortified and well-protected city. So Nebuchadnezzar had every reason to believe that he was protected, that he was safe, that he was secure, and that he was satisfied here in this city. But one night, he had a strange dream. He had a dream that bothered him. It troubled him. It even, it even scared him. And this isn't the first time that God has spoken to King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. I mentioned, the, I mentioned in Daniel chapter 2 that he had another dream that Daniel was able to interpret for him. And that was a dream that, that had to do with, with uh, where God was revealing God's plan for the ages as this, as this dream uh, w w was, was interpreted by Daniel. But this dream in Daniel chapter 4 is different. It's very personal. It's about King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And we began reading about that in verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my place. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed uh, and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they may make known to me the, uh, the interpretation of this dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make it known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belshazzar according to the name of my God, and him is, is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. So if you look there in verses 2 and 3, we see the reason that Nebuchadnezzar is telling this story. The reason that he is telling this story, he wants to relate what the Most High God has done for him. And then you'll leave a notice in verse 1, you know, who, who, is, who is he writing this to? To all lands, to all people in, in every land. Then in verse 4, we, see that we find the king resting. And every indication that everything is going well. It's just, a, it's just another normal day in the palace. Everything is going just, just as it should, and, and it's just a normal day. The Bible says that he is flourishing there in his palace. But once again, this peaceful sleep is interrupted by this dream that he has. And once again, he calls for all this, the smart people, all the wise people, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, all these wise people in, in the land at that time. And he calls for them to try to interpret this dream. And I'm going to tell you something, they weren't very happy about it. They didn't want to try to interpret this dream because the last time he had a dream, they all almost died. And if it hadn't been for Daniel being able to interpret this dream, they would have died. And so they come in and, they're, and again, they're not able to interpret this dream. And so at last... He summons Daniel in verse 8. And notice he talks about Daniel. And he talks about his God and how Daniel has been named after his God. But yet he also acknowledges that the spirit of the Most High God dwells inside of him. And what you see here is kind of a straddling of the fence. He acknowledges the Most High God, but he's still worshiping his false gods. And so he's acknowledging those two things, but he's still honoring the false God at the same time. Then in verse 10, he tells the dream to Daniel, notice... This dream has two distinct parts. Verse 10, it says, these, it says, These were the visions of my head while I was on my bed. And I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its heights reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to all the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its, a, its fruit abundant, and, it, and in it was food for all. 
The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt under its branches. And all flesh was fed from it. What a lovely dream. I mean, it's just the greatest dream a man could ever have, right? But then look at verse 13. The second part of the dream says, I saw in the visions of my head while I was on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven, and he cried aloud and said this, Chop down the tree and, it, and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast come out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of the heaven and let him graze with the beast on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man and let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers. And the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men. Give it to whoever he will, gives it to whoever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Yet now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able because the spirit of the holy one is in you. And so the first part of the dream, we see this massive tree, this great massive tree. The branches went as far as the eye could see. And in, those bird, and in those branches and leaves, the birds were there. And even under the branches, it provided shade for all these animals who lived around this tree. Just, just a great and mighty tree uh, that, 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 that was there. And that's what he saw in this vision. But then the second part, we saw that the tree was cut down. These limbs were stripped off of it, and the, and the tree was cut down, and it was bound as a stump with a, with a band of iron and bronze. And somehow, through all of this, and, and if you've ever had weird dreams, you know sometimes things can go from being one thing to another right in the middle of a dream. We see that this stump all of a sudden turns into a, a beast who was there living among the animals for seven years. Now, maybe it was because Nebuchadnezzar played so prominently in the first dream, or, what, or whatever it was, he knew this was a very important dream. He knew that the, this dream had a meaning and he wanted to know what that meaning was, but he didn't know who it, who it was for. He didn't know what it was all about. And so he began to try to get this dream interpreted. And he calls on Daniel. Now remember Daniel, God had honored Daniel's commitment to him. Daniel had refused to eat the meat of the king. He had refused to eat at the king's table. And therefore God had honored, them, God honored him with the power and the wisdom to be able to interpret dreams. And now this, this uh, ability that, that Daniel has because of God is going, to be, is going to come necessary as Daniel explains the meaning of the dream to the king. Look at verse 19. It says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concerns your enemies. Now, understand when verse 19 says that Daniel was troubled by the dream, that doesn't mean he was confused. That doesn't mean that he didn't know what the dream meant. In fact, it meant I know what the dream means. I just don't want to tell you. It's a bad, it's a bad, and, and Nebuchadnezzar knew this. Nebuchadnezzar knew this was a bad message. And he knew that, that Daniel didn't want to be the one to, to be the bearer of bad news. He didn't want to deliver that, that message to the king. But, Belt, but, but the king Nebuchadnezzar tells him to tell him what the dream means. And here's what Daniel says. King, I wish this message was for somebody else. I wish this message was for your enemies, but it's not. You are the tree. You are the tree, and you will be cut down. I thought about the story of Nathan as the prophet Nathan, as God gave him the, the interpretation of this, of this or, or gave him this parable to tell the king, David. And he comes before David and said, Thou art the man. This is exactly what Daniel is telling his king, is thou art the one. And then basically what you find from verses 20 through 24 is, is that, uh, that, the, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to uh, experience the judgment of God, and he's going to go from being this beautiful tree, well-flourished and abundant, to being nothing more than a beast, a burden of the, uh, uh, out in the grass, eating and covered with dew. Look at verse 25. It says, They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven and seven times shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. Now, key phrase there in verse 25 says, till you know that the Most High rules. Until you know that the Most High rules. So seven years 
We see the king of the greatest country in the world. The, the, probably the most powerful man in the world at that time. For seven years, he will live as a wild beast. And having lost his mind, he will live with the beast until he acknowledges that God alone is sovereign. Then in very simple, very matter-of-fact terms, verse 28 tells us it happened exactly as Daniel said it was. It said, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. And then you'll notice in between verses 28 and 29 that 12 months passed by. A whole year goes by and the king had time to change his ways. You see, Daniel delivered that message and told him what the dream meant. And 12 months passed by and nothing changed in Nebuchadnezzar's life. He had plenty of time to repent. He had plenty of time to change his ways. Isn't that just like God? He always gives space for repentance. He always gives us time to go, to go his way. But when we turn our backs towards him, judgment must come when he delivers his word. Now, maybe he thought he had plenty of time. Maybe he didn't truly believe that God could bring him down. Maybe he thought that he, he was above God. But whatever the reason was, he did not change his ways. But one day there came a moment that changed his entire life. Look at verse 29. It says, At the end of the 12 months, he was walking uh, about in the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is this not great, Babylon, that I have built for a royal, for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Now notice the personal pronouns in, that, in those two verses. Look at this great kingdom that I have built that for my, by my power, for my great honor. You just see the pride welling up and he's just walking around the kingdom walking around the palace with his chest bowed out towards God, looking at all that he had done. But soon, Nebuchadnezzar would learn the error of his ways. Now listen, I'm going to give you a word of encouragement. Don't ever do that. Don't ever, don't, don't ever challenge God the way that Nebuchadnezzar did. I mean, you, you're seeing a man who is walking around not acknowledging God whatsoever. He's walking around more or less shaking his fist at God. Don't ever do that. Don't ever... Take glory that belongs to God because the moment you start doing that, you're just daring God. You're daring God to show you who is in control. And we're going to see in a moment that, 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 that King Nebuchadnezzar found out who was in control. And it probably, does, it probably doesn't need saying this, but I'll say it. If you ever do find yourself in the position where you feel the need to take credit for something that God has done, and you hear a voice from heaven, you better brace yourself. You better get to hiding because it's fisting it's fist to get ugly. And so that's what we see because God is not going to sit idly by while you try to take credit for something that he has done. God is not going, not, not going to allow that. So the voice comes and announces the judgment. Then just as swiftly, Nebuchadnezzar loses his mind. Look at verse 33. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. What a picture. I googled that. I googled to see what people thought Nebuchadnezzar may have looked like with his hair grown out like eagle's feathers and his fingernails grown out like eagle's claws. And if those people are right, the people that drew those pictures, that was an ugly dude. I'm telling you, I mean, just what a sight. The king, the greatest man in the world, God had a way of humbling him. And this is the thing that he had done. It's hard for me to imagine a more severe punishment for King Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine what could God have done else to try to humble him? I believe that he, he'd done exactly what was needed to be done. How far will God go? Whatever's necessary. That's what God will do to humble the proud. Here's a man, the greatest man in the world for seven years. He's galloping around on all fours with his fingernails growed out, and he's making grunting noises, and he's mooing with the cows, and he's eating grass. You talk about, about a man who would be humbled. You see, here's a man who couldn't be, even though he was still had the title king, he couldn't rule the land. He couldn't have meetings with his, with his royal people. He couldn't make decisions. He couldn't do anything that a king needs to do. God had brought him down to the place where he would recognize who was king. Now, why would God do such a thing? Why would God do such a thing to this great and mighty king? Well, he claimed something that belonged to God. He claimed glory that belonged to God himself. His mental insanity, in my mind, it started with spiritual insanity. You know what spiritual insanity is? It's pride. Anytime we start claiming God's credit, that's where insanity begins. And so his mental insanity began with spiritual insanity when he began to take the pride and take, the, take his pride and give his self-honor that belonged to God alone. But that's not the end of the story. 
Seven years later, the king's life took another dramatic turn. Look at verse 34. It says, And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So just as suddenly as he had lost his mind, in an instant, he regained his sanity. He regained his mind. Now, how, how did that happen? How did he regain his sanity? Well, look at it. Very insightful right here. First of all, he looked up. In other words, he lifted his eyes towards heaven. He lifted his eyes and he acknowledged the great and mighty God. And then it says that he woke up, which means his, his sanity was restored to him. And he spoke up and he praised the Most High God. That's, that's what we see there. And we know that he was truly changed because of what he said when he came to his, to his senses. Look at uh, verse 34, the second part. It says, for his dominion, talking about God, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will and in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? You see, this once pagan king, this king who, who, who only acknowledged God, now he praises God. He has truly gotten the message. And here's the message that he got. God can do whatever he wants. God can do whatever he pleases to do and no one can stand against him. Just like the song says, you have no rival, you have no equal. You know, he is, he is the one, he is the most high God. See, eighth, earthly kings, they rule by God's permission. And they only stay in power as long as God sees fit. God's in control of even the greatest and the power, most powerful people in the world. And Nebuchadnezzar has learned this truth the hard way. And now he's proclaiming it for all the world to hear. Verses 36 and 37 give us the end of the story. And this is the moral we should take to heart. It says, At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I, re I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. In one sentence, here's what he said. Everything that God does is right. God doesn't make mistakes. Everything that God does, you see, that's where true biblical faith begins. That's where true biblical faith, that's one of the most clear statements about the wisdom of God's eternal plan. And with all the heartache and all the suffering and all the pain that we have oftentimes in our life, we have to come to that understanding, that basic foundational principle that God is in control. God knows what's going on. God hasn't made a mistake. It's all part of God's plan. He knows exactly what he's doing. And these words are true. And I would guess that any time before Daniel chapter 4 and the events that have taken place here, I bet you that Nebuchadnezzar probably would say, the greatest thing that ever has happened to me, and he would probably list a, 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 a battle that he had won or some kind of great building that he had built. But now I would think, and I would almost guarantee you that Nebuchadnezzar would say, the greatest thing that has ever happened to me was when God humbled me. Because now I'm able to see who God truly is. You see, that's, that was the greatest thing that ever could happen to, ne to, ne to Nebuchadnezzar. In his mind, the seven years wouldn't matter because they would seem a small price to pay in order to see who God truly was. And he, and he truly did. Now here's a test of whether or not you have grown through the disciplines of life. Can you look back with regret and thank God for those things? For those hard times, can you look back and say, thank God, because now I have grown closer to you. Now I see you more clearly. You see, you see that's where Nebuchadnezzar was at that, at, at that time. And see, Nebuchadnezzar, I don't believe he was even embarrassed about it. Here's a king who was walking around on all fours and feeding on grass. He wasn't embarrassed about it. Why else would he write it down for the whole world to read? He wasn't embarrassed about it. He knew that he had grown closer to God because of it. And so we can know that we have made a spiritual breakthrough when we can, when we can tell your own story without feeling a need to embellish or cover up the negative aspects. I began by saying God has a way of humbling the arrogant. God has a way of humbling the arrogance. You see, and if we get nothing else out of this story, we must learn this truth. And here are four principles I want to give us this morning of how that will help us understand how God deals with us when we attempt to live without him. First thing, God's righteousness causes him to intervene when we believe we don't need him anymore. You see, whenever we think that we can live without God, whenever we think we've got it all together and we think that we're more powerful and in our own minds we've got everything worked out and we don't need God, God begins in, 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 this, in this dream, and look, looking at the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he begins to shake our tree a little bit. And when we don't listen to that, he begins to cut away the things that we're placing our confidence in. 
and we're going, we're going down the wrong road, and he tries to wake us up. He tries to make us see the things, and sooner or later, he will intervene. Now, how does that intervention come? We see how it came for, for Nebuchadnezzar. It may be different for you. You may have a different way of God. What God may wake you up a different way. God, God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And so he may wake you up in another way than he woke Nebuchadnezzar up. Number two, God's judgment is painful because he's cutting away the sin that pulls us away from him. Imagine you have a, a pain in your abdomen, and it gets so bad you decide you're going to go to the doctor. And the doctor runs some tests, and he does x-rays, and, and they find out, and he comes back and he says, you've got a tumor in your abdomen. But it's not that bad. It's all contained. We found it early. The only thing we have to do is go in and do a surgery, remove that tumor, and everything's going to be fine. You say, no, no, you're not, you're not cutting on me. I, I, I just, I'd just rather take my chances. And the doctor says, if we don't remove it, you're going to die. You see, God's, God's punishment oftentimes is painful. It's painful, and it, and, and it all, and it, and it was all, but it's always for our good. God's disciplinary judgment is rarely easy and never painless. And in Nebuchadnezzar's case, it was utterly devastating and totally humiliating. You see, sometimes God has to cut down the tree in order to save the tree. Can you agree with that this morning? Sometimes God has to, to not only shake us, but to cut down the tree in order to save it. Thirdly, God's discipline lasts until we learn the lesson that he wants to teach us. I'm sure for many people here this morning feel like God's shaking your tree right now. And you're wanting to know, how long is this going to last? How long am I going to have to endure this, what God has, has got me going through? And the only possible answer I can give you is, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how long it'll last, but I do know this. It won't last one second longer than, than God sees necessary in order to wake you up, in order to get your attention. You see, the trials of life are ordained by the Lord for our benefits. He alone knows when it will end. He alone knows what is best for you. But God will never shake your tree longer than what is necessary. And one moment longer than is necessary. And he will never stop one second before his divine purpose in your life has been accomplished. So if you're finding yourself this morning in a hard place, in, in a difficult place, and you long for those days of peace and contentment in your life, I can guarantee you if you'll come this morning, you'll humble yourself before God, that he will restore your peace. You see, that's all it takes is a humbleness, a humility before God. Number four, God's purpose in humbling us is not to destroy us, but to draw us back into fellowship with him. You see, that's the ultimate piece of good news for Daniel chapter 4. If we stand back and look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar here in Daniel chapter 4, we see three things. First of all, we see prosperity. Then we see judgment. And then we see restoration. You see, it's tempting for us to only look at the judgment. It's tempting for us to only look about the, the part of the story where, where Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, where he's, where he's brought down to where he's feeding with the oxen and his fingernails are grown out. It's tempting for us to do that, but to do that is to overlook the whole story. The whole story shows us where he started with prosperity and then judgment and then restoration. By the end of the chapter, the, 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 the king has restored, restored his sanity and he's regained his throne and he's, and he's even increased in his earthly glory. And along the way, he has learned the hard lesson that God is sovereign over all the affairs of man and that those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You see, from the king's point of view, all that God did was good. He ends up better off in, in every way. Morally and spiritually, financially, everything, he ended up better than he was before. And in this, we can take great comfort. Though God should, uh, for a season, afflict us with many trials, and though many of those trials may be of our own foolish doing, his purpose is not to destroy us, but to purge us from our sin that we might be brought into close fellowship with him. You see, in that sense, Nebuchadnezzar's insanity was a severe mercy from God. You say, God showed him mercy? God, God showed him mercy in, in causing him to become a beast out into the field. He restored his sanity, and he brought him back to where he needed to be. And if our tree, if the tree of our life is not only shaken, but it's cut down for all together, just remember the root still remains. And God is doing that for a reason, to bring us back, just like he did King Nebuchadnezzar. One final thought. I find myself coming back to this time and time again as, I, as we read this passage. Very, very simple, very basic, very foundational truth of the entire Bible. God is God, and we're not. God is God, and we're not. I don't think there's any more truth that's more fundamental than this one. And if we can never grasp, our, grasp that in, in our minds, that God is God, God is in control, and we're not, we will never grow in our relationship with God. We will never be able to be obedient to Him. We will never be able to walk in faith the way that He wants us to walk. 
if we can't grasp a hold of the truth that God is God and we are not. The greatest thing that I see in this chapter is grace. And the greatest thing I see is hope. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king, a king that, that only acknowledged God. Before he met Daniel, he didn't even know God. He didn't even know God, but now by the end of the chapter, after God has had his way in his life, we find a king who is worshiping God, who probably has a better understanding of who God is than most of us here today. He, is, he understood that God was a God who was in control. God was a God who was sovereign. God was a God who was over all the affairs of man. This is what King Nebuchadnezzar understood, and therefore King Nebuchadnezzar could praise God for bringing him to the place that he had brought him. Even though it caused him heartache, even though it caused him pain, he knew that all in the end, it was worth it. You see, that's what God can do. And only God can do that. God's the only one who can do that in our lives. See, he knows how, he knows how to get our attention. He knows how to ring your phone. He knows your number day or night. And he knows whatever circumstances it'll take to bring you back to him. He will and he can do it. Which brings me back to where I began this morning. How far will God go? How far, what will God have to do in your life to get your attention? What will God have to do in your life this morning for you to be obedient to him? You see, I was a man who ran from God more than, on more than one occasion. I remember I was nine years old when God began to call me to salvation. And I have no idea why a nine-year-old wouldn't want to give his life to the Lord, but I didn't. I ran from it. And I began to have dreams. And I began to have things going on in my life. God got my attention. Is God trying to get your attention this morning? Whatever call God has placed on your life, whether it's a call to ministry, whether it's a, 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 a call to salvation, whatever it is this morning, submit yourselves to God, humble yourself before God, and He will bring you to the place He wants you to be. Let's pray this morning.